Hi. I would like to say a few words before starting. During the 60s, the Fluxus movement changed the way people understood music and art pieces. It was a, it was a real revolution in art. Nowadays, most of the significance of Fluxus is lost. I think the main reason this has happened is because our context is completely different from the context in which these pieces were created. Nowadays, most of the Fluxus pieces can look irrelevant, and when someone decides to perform a Fluxus piece, the action is often understood as a museum object. In fact, today we are in a museum, so what I'm saying is probably not surprising to any of you. The fact of uh, the act of per performing a Fluxus piece today could never be the same, could never have the same effect as then as when Fluxus pieces were in first introduced 50 years ago. So it wouldn't be so Fluxus to repeat a Fluxus piece now. It's almost the opposite to what the artists were doing then. In fact, according to one of the Fluxus manifestos, Fluxus art must be simple, amusing, unpretentious, concerned with insignificances, require no skill or countless rehearsals, and have no commodity or institutional value. The contradiction with the situation that we have right now is clear. This event is part of the program of an institution, and the artists that are performing today are being quite well paid, including myself. In order to take into account this contradiction, I thought that the least I can do is briefly describe each of the pieces before performing them. I hope these explanations will help provide a better comprehension of the pieces, not only the ones that I will perform, but also those performed by uh, other artists. Uh, the first piece I will perform is called Two Durations, which was composed by George Brecht in 1961. The piece's instructions consist of only two words, red, green. This piece forces a shift of our conception of time, or maybe creates an indiscernible place between our conception of time and our conception of vision. It seems that Brecht wants to shift our understanding of music as a time-specific kind of art, since, the perception, since time perception is the condition for experiencing music as it is for experiencing anything else. I think that the reference to colors, to the duration of colors, is more specifically a call for visual artists to reconsider time as a fundamental factor in their work. We tend to think of painting, for example, as not time-specific, but in fact we wouldn't be able to perceive a painting outside time. In other words, time is a fundamental part of our perceptual experiences. Without it, we couldn't experience anything. In this piece, Brecht is showing, is showing us this problem which was quite revolutionary in regard to the art world if we think that the piece was composed in 1961. I will perform now these two durations, red, green.
Thank you. The next piece I will play is called Opus 13 from 1961 from Eric Anderson. The piece instructions read Do and or don't do something universally. In this piece there are two remarkable innovations. Firstly, there is the choice the composer gives the interpreter, an important choice, either to do or not to do something. While this may not seem revolutionary, I think it was, it was quite creative for, for the time. What Anderson is showing us is that every single piece is somehow an order given by the composer to the interpreter. An order that can be summarized in two words. Do this. With this piece, Anderson reacts against this presumption. He grants the interpreter the freedom to either perform or not perform the content of the piece. The actual content of the piece, an action that has to be performed universally, is also very innovative. After all, what does it mean to do something universally? For example, now I'm sitting on this chair. How could I sit on this chair universally? Maybe only certain actions can be done universally. It's not clear, but it's a good opportunity to think about it. Anderson gives complete freedom to the interpreter. Do and or don't do. But afterwards, he somehow takes this freedom away. He doesn't constrain the interpreter, but he takes him into a state of confusion. How could one possibly do something universally? I think that the freedom that the interpreter receives is, in the end, of little use for him. The piece speaks about the idea of freedom in a way that was not thought of it before. And it could even be taken as a critique of freedom, insofar as we normally understand it. This is, to have the possibility to do what you want. This critique might be connected to the society of control, as Foucault describes uh, our actual society but the interpretations are, of course, multiple. I hope that this explanation will provide a better understanding for the, problem, the problems addressed with, uh, within this piece. Opus 13, 1961. Do and or don't do something universally. Music for My Son, a piece by Jill Curtis that I feel is related to Anderson's Opus 13, as it also deals with the notion of freedom. The instructions for the piece read, do not prepare for the performance and even try to forget that in a short time you will be performing. When the, when the time of the performance comes, simply do something appropriate. In this piece, Curtis shows us freedom from another perspective. The performer can basically do whatever he or she wants, but it should be something appropriate. Freedom connected to something appropriate. It reminds me of Spinoza's concept of freedom, which I don't think has been considered seriously enough by artists nowadays, who tend to have a more classical understanding of freedom. According to Spinoza, Freedom has nothing to do with having the freedom to make decisions, since he didn't believe that decisions were something real. Spinoza believed that the decisions were only in our imaginations, since our conception of time is very limited in comparison with God's conception of time, for whom time happens all at once and not as successions of events. This is also related to Giordano Bruno. 
This conception of time might seem deterministic, but in, Spin in Spinoza's logic, it was not. In this logic, freedom is obtained when we act out of our own necessity. Being free is more about affirming our own necessity than about feeling that we, we can decide things. Jill Curtis, music for my son. Do not prepare for the performance and even try to forget that in a short time you will be performing. When the time of the performance comes, simply do something appropriate. Of course, I decided to do nothing, since it seemed that I was not doing anything in the last two other pieces. I felt that it would be appropriate to do nothing in this piece as well. <coughs> I think it worked, it worked out quite well. The next piece is another piece by Curtis, called, uh, called Opus One. The instructions are one or more persons, two, sense, and or think. In this piece, the performer is also giving a lot of freedom. However, Curtis distinguishes three different planes actions, feelings, and thoughts. Do, sense, think. This is very interesting. Most compositions concentrate on the actions the interpreter is instructed to perform, but his or her feelings or thoughts are not understood as part of the piece. I think the art world has still not understood the importance of this piece. The majority of pieces are still preoccupied by the actions players, performers or actors are taught to deliver, but a performer's feelings and thoughts remain uh, primarily irrelevant. For example, if you have to kiss another actor during a theater piece, you're asked to perform this action with certain credibility. No one would ask you to feel love for the other actor. You, you can have all the thoughts and feelings you want as long as you deliver the action properly. In this piece, Curtis reacts against this, bringing into the scene these thoughts and feels which he deems as important as the action itself. Opus 1, another groundbreaking Fluxus piece. One or more persons do, sense and or think. Of course, since now I'm working alone, you will see the version for one person. Do, sense and or think.
Thank you. The next piece I will perform is a piece by Klinberg. I think this piece goes even farther than Curtis' piece. It's called Identification Exercise. Identify yourself with a Graham cracker, a gramophone, a granger, a grapefruit, a grass blade, a grape digger, a Greek, a greenery, a green egg, a grindstone, a grip sack, a grizzly, a grout nut, a gross, a grab X, a bandit team, the golf stream, and a grind. But what does it mean to identify yourself with something? Is it an action, a feeling, or maybe it's just a thought that you should have? I believe that the process of identification doesn't have to do with any of these things. That's why I think that this piece is more complex and innovative than, than Curtis Opus One. Klinberg is not speaking of actions, feelings and thoughts, but point, pointing at the faculties that produce our actions, feelings and thoughts. Identification is connected to conscious, conscious and, by extension, to the ability of being self-conscious. In this way, Klinberg's piece might be an answer to Kant. For Kant, the ability of being self-conscious the ability to identify ourselves with ourselves is what makes us objects, subjects. More than that, is what allows Kant to define us by our ability to know. According to Kant, you cannot know if you are not first self-conscious. If you can't identify with yourself, you cannot exercise any knowledge. I feel that Klinberg, in this identification exercise, is producing a dehumanization of the human. In this way, the peace is an open door to the unknown, a device that can set us free from the restriction of Kantian categories and definitions. Besides this, all the things that the performer has to identify with start with the letter G, except for the banditty. This doesn't have a clear explanation. Maybe there is a bandit team that starts, starts with the letter G. It might be a joke or just an element that reinforced by opposition the letter G in the other cases. In any case, the piece is probably one of the most influential pieces of the 20th century. And clearly, art, as we understand it nowadays, wouldn't be the same without this iconic work by, by Klinberg. Identification exercise. 1966. I guess by now you're starting to realize how revolutionary Fluxus was in its time and, uh, and that the art world as we know it wouldn't be the same had it not been for the work of this group of artists. These performances might not, be, might, might not seem so strong nowadays, but I'm sure that when you place them in context and explain them, as I'm doing, it is possible to appreciate them in full. The next piece is Ken Friedman's Mandatory Happening. The instructions read, you will decide to read or not read these instructions. Having made your decision, the happening is over. As we can see, the piece is also related to freedom. The performer is given the choice to read or not to read the instructions. But more than that, the piece understands that decision is an entity in and of itself, since the performance ends whenever the performer decides. What the performer is actually performing is this decision. In addition, the title of the piece, Mandatory Happening, 
tells the performer, performer that the action is happening. Happenings in the 60s were an attempt to integrate art and life. We all know how the idea of, ha of a happening was a radical change in art up until this point. In this piece, Friedman radicalizes the idea of happening, setting out a mandatory happening. The piece is not a proposal, it's an order. The usual sloppiness of happen happenings is therefore replaced in this piece by a more urgent and desperate call to integrate art and life. The several inter interpretations of this piece over the time have successfully integrated life and art. That's why to perform this piece nowadays is a challenge, since, in order to do so, the performer has to first separate art and life again, and then reunify them once more. It's quite a compli complicated thing to do, but it is worth the, the effort to try it. I don't need to mention the enormous impact that this piece had in the 60s and 70s, and what it represents for our everyday life. Mandatory happening. Thank you. The next piece, Forest Event Number no. 5, is also from Klintberg and is one of my favorite Fluxus pieces. In fact, it's one of my favorite pieces in general, not only among Fluxus. In order to fully understand it, you have to read the first that comes immediately before, which is Forest Event No. 4. It reads, Climb up into a tree, in, into a tree, saw off the branch to sit upon. This is it. Composed in 1966, it's a very simple piece in the Fluxus tradition, and it doesn't present the performer any particularly difficulty. As it is written, you just need to climb up into a tree and saw off the branch to sit upon. Nothing in the instructions forbids the performer from using a mattress to avoid injury upon falling from the tree. As you can see, the piece is not particu particularly special. But then, the next piece. Forest event number five is a masterpiece. It goes like this. Charlotte Moorman exchanged the sandpaper for a wood saw, but using that sawing technique, she would have been sucked from the lumberjacks and pickers union. What I like about this piece is that it's completely different from any other piece. Klindberg somehow despises the performer, the performance art, the art world, everything. How one would possibly perform this piece? How could he perform a comment? Imagine that I'm off in the woods and someone gives me a piece of paper with this piece written on it for me to perform it. I read it. Forest event number five. Charlotte Moorman exchanged the sandpaper for a wood saw, but using that sawing technique, she would have been sucked from the lumberjacks and pickers union. Nothing could be more disturbing. We know that Charlotte Moorman was a well-known cellist. We know that to play the cello would loosely resemble a person sawing. But what does the performer have to perform in this piece? I have the feeling that Klinberg's main achievement in this piece is the possibility of studying the process of reification. This means to turn into being. For Klinberg, the question seems to be, is it possible to avoid reification and still do something? It's like becoming invisible. You are not there, but you perform an inform, an event. 
Forest event number five is a subversive piece that somehow anticipates the social revolution of 1968. And in one way, it also forces the feeling of lack of sense in life and the world that characterized or still characterized postmodernism. Forest event number five. This is called A Tune and was written by Larry Miller in 1981. From all the pieces that I decided to perform today, this is the only one that openly refers to music. Instructions. Discover which notes in the octave is yours. This piece demonstrates that Fluxus was still alive in the 80s and that the creativity of the artist didn't stop in those 20 years. Fluxus was able to recreate itself. An artist developed radically new concepts that resulted in very intense performances. This often proves uh, problematic as the performances were so ahead of their time that they received strong reaction from the audience, which was not prepared for this kind of things. For a contemporary audience like you, this piece is probably just another typical event. But let's try, for a moment, to understand what this piece represented for its time. This Fluxus piece returns to the origin of Fluxus, which ultimately inspired postmodernism in the early 90s. It is from 1981, but this anticipates both the 80s and the 90s. When the craziness, when the craziness of the 60s and the 70s was, was over, artists slowly became bored conservative, and later on confused. This work demonstrates that there were still people in the 80s, like Larry Miller, showing a restless attitude, creating innovative works against the grain of his time. Discover which note in the octave is yours. When I read the piece, I imagine an old fat guy drinking a beer, leaning on the counter of a fairly fancy bar, doing nothing besides enjoying his beer. I'm sure that most of you would agree that this old bored guy could also be understood as symbol for today's contemporary art scene. But by taking into account that this piece was written 30 years ago, we can understand the genius of Larry Miller, as well as the lasting validity and relevance of Fluxus. It's unquestionable value to our times and its delightful aesthetics, not to mention its undeniable impact on social political events. Fluxus has inspired generations of Americans, and this piece is one of the best examples. Action.
Thank you.